Well, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Man, it is so good to be with you, especially on a day like this where we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus came to earth for us. Man, I tell you what, I think being in church today really proves that you believe this day is actually about Jesus. So well done. It's so good to be with you. Um, I don't know if you've told all the people around you Merry Christmas, but you're soon going to discover that I like to have interactive messages. I like you to be part of what I'm preaching on. And so I want, I want to give you like a moment just to learn the names of the people you might be sitting alongside and wish them a Merry Christmas. Go for it. Well, I might ask you to say one or two more things to them as we continue with the message. And now you've seen, you see that don't bite. And if they did bite you, don't sit next to them next Sunday, okay? And I want to just give a special welcome to all of you who maybe have come because we invited you. In fact, we send out invitations to every house in Del Judah proper and Model Park because we thought it would be really important to celebrate this day with our neighbors. So if you're here because of that invite, a special welcome to you. We love our neighbors in the city. Thank you for coming here. And, uh, and a special welcome to any out-of-town visitors. Maybe you've come with family and you're staying with family for Christmas and they've brought you to church. I want to say on behalf of Whitbank Imalishlani, welcome to the promised land. Well, you, you've made it. You're here. This is as good as it gets. We love the city and we love that you chose to spend Christmas here out of all the places in the world because it doesn't get better than this. Man, um, one of the things I just find so interesting about Christmas is that it's kind of the one birthday in the world where everyone else gets a presents except for the guy whose birthday it is. Isn't that interesting? And you know, it's, it's, it's probably the only party that that ever happens at. And, and for me, it's really a sign of how transformative and incredibly powerful God's love is. God's love really did change the entire world. And His love was selfless and generous and exuberant and giving. And even as we celebrate His birthday, His love forces us to practice generosity on each other. How cool is that? In fact, it's this kind of love that I really want to focus on today, on Christmas Day. It is the love of Jesus that I want to speak about today. For the last four weeks, we've been doing what we call an Advent journey with this church. And every single week, we've been remembering a different characteristic of something that Jesus brought to earth as we anticipate this day. Christmas Day, which finally is here. It's finally here. And so we've lit a candle every Sunday as a representation, as a symbol of the light of God coming into these parts of our life. And so we've seen the light of God reignite our hope and our faith and our peace and our joy. And today we're going to invite the love of God to ignite our love. Because actually... The love is the greatest of them all. This is what it says to us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. In fact, it reminds us how great God's love is. Look at your neighbor, whether you're here or in the minor hall, look at them and say, the love of God is great. Church, the love of God is great, and it's worth celebrating, especially on a day like today, because it's a love of God that sent Jesus Christ to this world. It's a love of God that is great. Our love is not great. Your love isn't that great, and my love is not that great. In fact, our love is pretty flimsy and unreliable at the best of times. Your love fluctuates. Your love 
changes. There, there were things that you used to love that you no longer love. For example, how many of you women over the age of 20 would have loved a Barbie doll this year for Christmas? Right? Very few. How many of you men over 20 would have loved a remote control car? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we take a little longer to grow up. Uh, and, and to be fair, there are some incredible remote control cars out there. So yeah, uh, okay, maybe bad example. But for example, my, one of my sons, he, he's now 10. Five years ago, he would have loved a Ninja Turtle toy for Christmas. And now if I gave it to him, that would have been like an insult. Because uh, the things we love, it changes over time. When I was a kid, I used to love peppermint crisp chocolates. In fact, I used to challenge myself to try suck off all the chocolate and just have the peppermint crisp left behind. Now I hate peppermint crisp chocolates. Right? I did it too much as a kid. Now I hate it. Don't give me that. Right? Because I loved, maybe you used to love pizza or the color blue or you too. And something happened. And now your love has changed because this is, the truth of humanity, our love fluctuates. Our love is unreliable. Our love changes, but that is not the kind of love we get to celebrate today. That is not the kind of love we celebrate today on Christmas Day. The kind of love that we celebrate today, the kind of love that God teaches, the kind of love that Jesus brought to us, the kind of love that we see in Scripture is a kind of love that compelled the God of creation to leave heaven and the throne and come and dwell among us as a fragile, vulnerable, human baby. The kind of love we celebrate today is a kind of love that, that made God think that he was willing to put himself in his own creation. <laughs> think about that for a moment. God was willing to subject himself to come and dwell in, in his own creation because he loved us so much. In fact, in order for Jesus to come as this baby, he had to be prepared to empty himself of all his divine privileges and power. We read about this in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing but taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even to the cross. Those words, to become nothing, it's in the Greek, it paints this picture of a bucket that's full of something that's then being turned over and being emptied until every single drop is gone. This is what Jesus was prepared to do for you and me because of his love for us. He was prepared to empty himself of his divine privileges, of everything that made him God. He gave up the right, and, and, and he allowed himself to dwell in a dependent, vulnerable baby's body because of love for you. Because of love for me, this is a kind of love that we celebrate today. And then when the crowds and religious leaders come around Jesus, and they asked Jesus, what's the most important thing to do? What's the most important commandment? It's interesting that these two words, love, love, they, they show up again in the most important commandments. When they asked Jesus, what's the most important thing we have to do? He uses this word again, love. Love, the most important thing to do is to love God. Love people. Love God. Love people. Love God and love people. In Jesus' own words, we read about it in Mark 12, verse 28. It says, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love. Can you all say love? Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus was saying, this is the meaning of life. This is our purpose. We were created to love. 
You were created to love. Perhaps you walked in the doors to this today thinking, man, I don't know what my purpose is in life. I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know what I'm meant to do with my life. Let me tell you, love God, love people. You want to know what you were made for? You want to know what you are created for? Love God and love people you were created to love. It's the most important thing you can do with your whole life. Look at someone close by and say, you were created to love. I was created to love. You were created to love. This is when you are truly being your true self. And here's kind of where it gets a bit tricky. When I look at those two things, love God and love people, how many of you know one of those is a lot easier to do than the other? Right, I mean, I look at God, first of all, wow. He's my perfect dad. He loves me unconditionally. He's always been there for me. He's never dropped me. He's never been unreliable or unfaithful. He's never lied to me. He, he gives so much. He gives love and salvation, and, and he gives me his presence, and he gives me power, and, and he gives me wisdom and counsel and comfort and strength, and it's just this God, and I just look at him, and I just want to love him, and then I look at you guys And some of you are weird. And some of you are moody and broken and angry and complicated and unreliable. And then I look at God. <laughs> One of these is easier to love than the other. And so I think we'd be tempted to go to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, which one's the most important one? Which one of these do I really have to get right? Surely there's a number one and a number two, because if I can at least get one of them right, then I know that I'm doing okay, right? And, and I, and I, and I want to love you, God, but honestly, I don't even like people, right? And, and we, we hear Christians say this all the time, I don't really like people. And so we might go to God and say, okay, God, tell me, which is the most important, to love God or to love people? And Jesus would say to us, yes. Like, no, 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 God, tell me which one. Jesus, tell me, do I need to love God or love people more? Yes. Yes to both. Yes, love God. Yes, love people. They are the two sides of the very same coin. And the very fact that you're asking that question means you don't get the point yet. For Jesus, the love of God and the love of people are in separable. You cannot separate them. In fact, your love for God will be shown by how much you love people. Your love for God will be shown, will be evident by how much you love people. And so for you to say you don't really like people, you don't really like human beings, it's a reflection of What's happening in your relationship with God? Jesus would say, you can't really say that you love me, the creator, but you don't love my creation. Jesus would say, you can't really love me, the father, and reject my children at the same time. We're a package deal. This is an inseparable thing. You have to love both God and people. And so which is the most important? Both. <laughs> both. Love God, love people. And now that might sound like a beautiful thing until we realize we don't even know what love really means. As human beings, we don't really get it. We use this word love to describe strong emotions and very weak emotions. We'll say in the same sentence, I love milk tart and I love Jesus. And you're like, whoa, 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 stop the bus. What do you mean? Do you love Jesus like you love your favorite Marvel character? Do you love God the same way you love your shoes? Do you love your wife the same way I love milk tart? Because then your wife might be a bit offended. And she would have the right to be, and you should probably come for prayer afterwards. Uh, how, how, how do you love? We've, we've learned to use this word to describe anything we more than like. 
And so in, in a way, we've polluted this word and diluted its meaning and it's lost its punch. It's lost its awe. And so when we read in scripture that God loves us, we're like, okay, he probably loves us the same way I love jelly tots. And so if I do anything wrong, his love for me will be gone. So it's conditional. And then we read these words, love God and love people. And for us, we, we put it in a character. You know, we're like, man, I, I'll put it in a category there of the way that I love movies. And so I'm doing pretty good. Until we realize the kind of love that Jesus was talking about, it's not human love. You see, our human love is based on feelings, and it's a feeling that happens to you, and it changes. It's a feeling that happens to us, and when our feelings change, our love changes. That's how we love each other. You love Star Wars until they kill off your favorite character, right? You love a friend until they lie about you. You love seafood until you land up in a hospital for a week. You might even love your spouse until they hurt you too much. And so we, we have this human love that is a feeling that changes based on the relationship. It's a little bit like Santa's naughty and nice list. <laughs> right? If you're naughty, there's no ways you're getting my love. If you're nice, man, yeah, you can get some of my love. But God's love is not based on a naughty and nice Santa list. God's love is a different kind of love entirely. It's not a human love. It's a word agape. Can you all say agape? Agape love is something entirely different. And when Jesus said, love God and love people, this is the kind of love that he was talking about. When Jesus was sent to be born as a baby, it was this kind of love that compelled him to do it. And agape love is very different. First of all, agape love is always action. Action. In other words, you can always see agape love played out. It's always action. Agape love consists of three things. It's doing good things for someone else, being kind to someone else, and delighting in someone else. Doing good things, being kind, and delighting. In fact, agape seeks out people that it can be good to, seeks out people that it can do charitable things for, seeks out people that it can benefit and serve, and build up, and it's always faithful, and it's always committed. In fact, agape love doesn't react to the person who's receiving it. In other words, when the person receiving the love rejects the love, when the person receiving the love is ungrateful for it, when the person receiving the love doesn't even notice the love, agape love carries on. It's unconditional. It's not based on how the person is receiving the love. It goes on and on and on. And the good news today as we celebrate Christmas is this is the kind of love that God has for you. You see, agape love is a decision to put the needs of someone else above your own needs. And then... It goes even deeper than that. When you start to study agape love, you start to realize that true agape love doesn't wait for an opportunity to serve someone. It seeks an opportunity to serve someone. Real agape love looks for people who are in need, especially people who could not repay you even if they wanted to. Real agape love seeks out people like that, seeks out people who are the outcasts and forgotten. It seeks out people who are in desperate need, and it goes and serves them, gives them acts of goodwill and kindness and delights in those kinds of people. And then when you study agape love, it goes even deeper than that. Are you ready for this? When Jesus starts to teach in agape love, he pulls no punches and he starts to teach us that agape love, the ultimate standard of agape love is how, how well you treat that person that you can't stand. 
How well do you treat the person you cannot stand? We all have some of those people in our lives. In fact, the teaching of Jesus is so good on agape, I've got to read it to you right out of Scripture. It starts in Luke chapter 6 from verse 27. It says, but to you who are willing to listen. So look at someone next to you and say, are you willing to listen? It says this, I say, agape your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Agape, your enemies, he says it again. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Agape, your enemies. This kind of enemy embracing love is a kind of love that mirrors to people around you what God looks like. It mirrors to people around you, it reflects character and nature of God to your surroundings. This is the kind of love that we are celebrating today. It's the kind of love that sent Jesus to be born as a baby, and then Jesus lived out agape love, and he taught agape love, and we see him from the time of his birth to the time of his ascension. He is actively going out and looking for people that he can serve, looking for people that he can love, looking for people that he can do good to and be kind to and delight in. He actively seeks them out. He moves his whole life toward the poor and forgotten and those that society has rejected and overlooked, and he calls people no one else would even call. He shows us what agape love looks like, and then in the ultimate expression of agape love, Jesus dies for his enemies. He dies for those who have rejected him and mocked him, those who are beating him up. The ultimate act of agape love is the cross. You see, Jesus knew the only thing that could get rid of our sin was his blood, his perfect, God-filled blood. He knew that we needed to get rid of our sin because when we enter eternity, if we have sin on us, we can't be with God in heaven. And so the blood of Jesus is able to wash away our sin so that when we die, we can now be with God in eternity in this place called heaven. And so as the, as the ultimate act of love, Jesus died for the very people rejecting him, mocking him, betraying him. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God showed his great love, again, great love, for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Jesus has shown a god love to everyone listening to this message. He's shown it to us. You see, he sought us out and he showed us goodwill by giving us a gift we could never repay even if we wanted to. He showed us the ultimate act of kindness, the, the ultimate act of goodwill, and he delights in us when we were spiritually homeless and bankrupt. God gave us a spiritual home. He gave us a family that we can call our own. He gives us a, a, a home in eternity. He calls us loved. He gives us a place where we can belong. He gives us something we could never repay. It is agape, and he sought us out, and he did it. 
Not because we asked him, but because he, God, paid us first. He loves us first. See, the kind of love that Jesus shows us is not flimsy. It's not based on emotions. It's strong and consistent and always giving. And then we read this in the book of John, 1 John 4, 11. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, he agaped us that much, we surely ought to agape each other. See, the Christian authors in Scripture believe that if we fully got how much Jesus loved us, the reasonable response would be to love others. If we fully understood how much we were agape, the reasonable thing to do, the only thing to do would be to love other people. See, the core of the Christian faith is that we believe that in the center of the universe, there is a godly being overflowing with love, and that love was given to you and me through the person of Jesus Christ, and He gives it to us so that we can go out and create these communities of self, selfless, enemy-embracing love. That is our purpose. That is why we were created. You were created to love not in human love, but in agape love, others-focused, selfless, giving love. You see, when Jesus says we should love God and love people, he was saying, will you agape God, agape people? Our love is based in the seat of our emotions. It comes and goes depending on what we feel. Agape love is based in the seat of our will and decision-making. It is consistent and faithful. And so Jesus is saying, will you agape God? Will you agape God? In other words, will you go? Will you seek him out? Will you show him acts of kindness? Will you show him acts of goodwill? Will you delight in him? Will you show him how you love him through your actions more than just singing and, and speaking to him, but show him through your actions? And one of the things he wants you to action out is to go love his children. Will you go agape the children of God? Will you go agape the world? Will you go seek them out? Will you show them acts of kindness, acts of goodwill? Will you delight in people regardless of how they act to you, regardless of whether they forget you or reject you or ignore you or take you for granted? Will you go embrace every single enemy and do, do something that mirrors me in this world? Do something that reflects my heart in this world? In fact, the whole Bible and all the commandments is summarized in this. Agape God, agape people. But there's a twist. As there often is with God. Look at someone and say, are you ready for the twist? He has the twist. You are incapable of agape love. Human beings cannot agape. The only way we can is to be connected to the source. When you and I are connected to the source of agape, then it can flow through us. But we cannot agape on our own. So Jesus instructs us to do something he knows we cannot do alone. Why? Because he knows the very instruction to agape God and agape other people will force us to lean in and rely on God. Because when we realize, man, I'm actually selfish. I just think about me. I just want to feel love. I just want to think about me. When I realize I was born with a sinful human nature that I cannot love this selflessly on my own, it forces me to press into the presence of God, press into the Spirit of God, to allow Him to fill me with His love for people, and then I can love others. So Jesus gives us a command that forces us to rely on God every single day. If we're going to do this, if we're going to do the thing we were created to do, if we were going to live out our purpose, we have to have God. We cannot do it alone. We have to rely on Him. The idea is this, that the, the only group of people on the, on the face of the planet, the, the only group of people in the whole world that should be able to agape is Christians. We should look so weird to the world. We should be confusing them all the time. They should be asking us questions all the time like, hey, why? 
why are you doing that? Like, why are you always nice to me? I treat you terribly. Well, why, why do you keep giving that person a second chance, man? They, they're so horrible to you. Why do you keep loving those people? They, they don't even notice. They haven't even said thanks. They keep on taking you for granted. Why do you keep on doing it? Why, why, why? And when they ask us why, we can point to the source. And say, so look, that is the kind of love I've received. So now I freely give it so that you can see it. And the world will know. The world will know that agape lives in me. See, God, his very nature is love. He is love. And so when God is in us, the thing that people should be seeing is agape. Jesus said it like this in the book of John. In John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. God wants there to be these pockets of communities that are doing something in the world that no one else can do. Agape. Enemy embracing, others focused, selfless, giving, generous, kind, decision made, love that is faithful and consistent. Which means, guys, we lose the right to ever refuse to love someone. We've lost that right as children of God. When, when we died to follow Jesus, when we laid down our lives to follow him, we lost that right. We lose the right to refuse to love someone who's different to us, a different color or race or gender or ethnic group or language or background or culture. We lose the right to refuse to love those who have hurt us and lied about us and rejected us, we lose the right because that is not what agape does. And when we have the love of God in us, when we rely on God, He will fill us with this kind of love. In fact, we told this in Romans 5.5. 5, it says, For we know how dearly God agapes us because He has given us the Holy Spirit. Why? One of the reasons the Holy Spirit has been given to you, listen to this. To fill our hearts with his agape. It's one of the reasons we need the Spirit to fill our hearts with his agape love, because unless we are filled with his agape, we cannot fulfill our create our, our created purpose. We cannot fulfill the very thing we were put on earth to do. So the Holy Spirit fills us. God helps us love him, and he helps us love his children. And he helps us love the world. And so today, on Christmas Day, as we celebrate this love, as we celebrate the greatest act of love, God coming to live us as a baby, I want to ask you about your agape. As we read this instruction from Jesus, that the most important thing to do is to agape God and agape each other, I want to ask you, Who do you need to agape? Perhaps it's God. Perhaps you've realized that something in your relationship with God has become self-serving and self-seeking, and it's all about what you can get. And today you want to say, God, I am going to, I choose to love you. I, I choose to action out my love for you. I choose to action out acts of goodwill and kindness towards you. And God, I will delight in you. Maybe the Spirit of God is prompting you to agape Him more. Or perhaps it's others. Maybe you haven't just written off a person. Maybe you've just written off humanity. You're like, I hate people. I don't like people. I don't want to see people. Or perhaps there's one or two people in your life that you know you can't stand. And you realize the agape love of God compels you to serve them Embrace them and bless them. And so today, as I light the last of the Advent candles, this is symbolic of the light of Jesus Christ coming into the places and reigniting something in us. And in this very moment, I want you to think about the places where you are lacking agape. And we're going to trust that God 
through the Holy Spirit who fills us with agape love is going to enable you to agape God and agape people. Can you close your eyes? Whether you're here or in the minor hall or watching online, I want to ask you a question. Perhaps you've been listening today and you realize that you could never love like this because you aren't connected to the source. You realize you're, you're not yet a child of God. <laughs> you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. And so you would never be able to fulfill this purpose of loving God and loving people because you're not yet a child of God. I want to encourage you, that can change right now. In fact, Scripture calls our salvation a gift. This is the greatest gift you could ever receive. And I couldn't think of a better day to open this gift of salvation than on Christmas Day. Are you kidding me? How awesome is that? And so I know some of you, you know that God has brought you here for this moment, right now. He's brought you here so that you can join His family, receive His agape love, so that you can agape others. In fact, if you know that God has brought you here, and you want to become a child of God today, you want to become a Christian, I want to pray with you. And, and I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come to the front. But just so I know who I'm praying with, if you know that today you need to make the decision to become a child of God and receive that gift, will you just put up your hand where you're sitting and put it down so I know who I'm praying with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Man, heaven is going to be rejoicing today on Christmas Day because there are children of God joining the family. I want us to pray together as a church. Some of you might be praying this the first time. It's not the words that matter. It's really about what's happening inside. But I'd like us all to pray in support of those who are doing this today for the first time. And we're going to celebrate what God's doing in this room because he's about to fill people with his agape standard love. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for finding me. Thank you for choosing me. Today I come to you and I repent of everything I've done that was not of you. Please forgive me, God. I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. And I receive salvation. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you lived and died and rose again. And that you are Lord of all. So today, I give you my life. Be Lord of my life. From this day forward. Father God, I am grateful to become your child today. And I look forward to having a lifelong relationship with you. It starts today. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. Can we just celebrate what God just did in the room? <laughs> Woo! Amen.